following interview was conducted with Keith B. Smith, Professor Emeritus, Craner School of Management for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, June 29, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good afternoon, Dr. Good afternoon. Smith, and thank you very much. Let's tell us about where you were born and your parents in early years. I was born in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. My parents were uh, both from Indiana, but they had gone south after they got married, and uh, we lived there until I was 13. And then my uh, father decided he wanted to try something else, so he came. we came back to uh, uh, the Midwest, and we had intended to uh, try to find a place to live in Fort Wayne. Was he from Indiana originally? or They both were Fourth from Bluffton, actually. Okay, Bluffton, yeah. But we, for some reason, they couldn't find a, a suitable place to live in uh, Fort Wayne, so we, we bought a home in uh, just across the border in Ohio, Bryan, Ohio, B-R-Y-A-N. And that's where I went to school. Okay, did you go to grade school and high school there? I went to uh, grade school and then high school. Okay, tell us about high school. Were there any student organizations or what kind of program? Well, teachers? Uh, it was not a large uh, class, maybe 90 students. But I really had a good time. I, I was a good student, but I played hard too. I was a good athlete, and so a combination of, that kept me out of trouble, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, and I was involved in a lot of activities. But, uh, what particular sport? Basketball, probably. Basketball and baseball. Oh, good. Yeah. No, oh, that's fine. Okay. Then what? Then what about college? And then I think you went to Ohio State. I that went to Ohio State. My father had actually uh, <clears throat> started at Purdue for a year, and then he transferred to Michigan, and uh, graduated from Michigan in business. And I would have killed to go to Michigan, but we couldn't afford it, so I had Ohio to. State. I had to settle for Ohio State. That's but okay. In the, retrospect, the Ohio it's State. The Ohio State, yeah. It's like Rikers, the state university. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, tell us about campus uh, life Your at Ohio program. State. Yeah. Um, well, I was. Uh, I I took engineering. I decided to be an engineer and go, go into engineering. And the toughest uh, curriculum in engineering apparently was engineering physics. So I chose that because I had a lot of math and I just wanted to do that. And I studied hard, but I did well. And uh, I was in a fraternity and that kept me pretty well busy. I was in some campus activities, but not I was not a BMOC or anything like that. Sure, okay. Yeah. Did you live on campus all your own I time? lived in the fraternity house okay. for five years and then, we, then I got married and... Uh, did you meet your wife there? Yes, she was at Ohio State. That, I'm not married to her any longer, okay. but uh, yes, we met We met in high school, actually, and she went to Ohio State also. Okay. We got married right after I finished engineering, which was a five-year program, and then stayed on and did my MBA. So I did engineering, physics, and MBA, which was not a good idea to do them back-to-back, -back, but I did that in six years. Yeah. Well, researchers might just make a comment with engineering physics. I mean, that's kind of a term that people oh, say. Oh, I think what, so. You know, what is that? Yeah, okay. and it, it was good for me. Okay. What Was it a combination of the, did they have a lot of math in it or what? Oh, yeah, okay. yes. Whereas yeah. people think of industrial or civil or something no, like that. No, it was engineering physics. I, I suppose if it had a characteristic, it was a lot of math and a lot of electrical engineering. Okay. Those okay. kind of courses. So it's more in that vein. Yeah, rather than yes. Other. Good. Okay, then that brings, uh, and then you went to go to graduate school? Was there uh, any see, what did stuff? I do? No, no military oh. service. Okay. Uh, After you let's finished. see, what did I do? I went to work in aerospace in okay. Southern California, worked on the Apollo project of all things. My boss came in one day, I, was, I don't know what I was doing, and he said, uh, how would you like to work on Apollo? And I said, I would like to, but what is that? I had absolutely no idea what that was. So I did that for two or three years. Super. And then when, but I got kind of bored and I decided I wanted to go back and do some more school, get some more schooling. So decided to pursue a Ph.D. and came uh, to Purdue. Okay. Did, That's you, did you apply any other place or decided? Harvard. Okay. Harvard's program, however, was, a, was not a Ph.D. It was a DBA, Doctor of Business Administration. And I thought, I'm going to do all this work. I, I would like to be a Ph.D. Right. right. I don't know why, but that's what I thought. So. And I, it, it, Purdue was just great for me. Okay. I was actually in the... Um, you came in 66, right? Came in 63. And then finished in 66. 63 to 66. Okay. The, uh, the school, the Cranert School, what, I, I guess it was, was it Cranert then? It was almost Cranert then. They had had a Ph.D. program in economics, and they decided to start a uh, P, 
PhD program in management, and I was in the first class oh, of that. There were only about 10 of us started out. Now, the Craner Building was not built at that time, Well, no, it? we were in Stanley Colder Annex, okay. but moved to Craner during my second of three years there. And uh, they, so I was teaching accounting to, to, to eat, and they uh, gave me a little carol in the library. So on the third floor of Craner, there's a, a series of carols, and I had I shared one of those. Very good. What was the campus like in those days? Well, it seemed big then, and, but not as big as now. Sure. Uh, right. Pretty much looked the same. All right. the buildings were brick and were pretty where, well kept. Where did you live when you were here as a grad student? Uh, I lived in, uh, my wife and I lived in uh, Williamsburg, down on, the, down on the river. Okay. okay. And that was new. That's so we, one, of, it's one of the older complexes. We moved in when I th we moved into building number two, and at that time there were only two or three buildings, but now there are twenty. Did you have uh, children by that time? No. Okay. The children came much later. Okay. Okay. So, and then you did some teaching while you were finishing. Yes, I did teaching for two of the three years, and then I the third year was just working on a dissertation. Right. Who was your major prof? Bob Johnson. Do you know that name? Uh, rings a bell. Well, he's deceased now, he, recently. He's been retired for some time, but he, he'd come from Michigan State and started the finance group. Okay, okay. And I was one of his first students. Sounds good. Okay, then uh, what came next? I'll now talk about your career path after, before you came to Purdue. Was that at UCLA then, the grad school? Is that where you went after Well, after I got my... PhD. No, I didn't, uh, no. I, when I got my PhD, I, uh, my first academic job was UCLA. And I didn't really, that's where I wanted to go. For some reason I wanted to go to Southern California. And so I didn't really apply at a lot of places. I, for some reason I applied at Tulane and maybe one or two other places. The only place I ever really wanted to go was UCLA and I spent 13 years there. Really? Good, that's good. And what tell, what tell us a little about, uh, you were with the manuscript, school, but also you were associate dean for a couple of yeah, years. Yeah, I was, I was an assistant dean for a while, and then I was the associate dean the last, oh, three or four years before I left UCLA. By then I had two daughters. Okay. And they were growing up, and the school system in Southern California was not very good, and so decided to find a smaller community and remembered... Uh, Purdue, the Craner, or remembered the uh, that school. Okay, and did then you? Uh, I had a chance to. I applied and had a chance to come back here. I actually came back as the dean of the school. That's right. In '66. Uh, I've been here ever since. No, you came in '79, didn't you? Or I'm sorry, '79. Right. Yeah. Okay. '66 is when I left to go to right. Southern California. It changed a lot in those it years. It did. Did yeah. you get? You didn't come back during the interim at all for any business. Or no, anything? I didn't even have any contacts except. What maybe about an alumni group out there in California? Did you join that for Purdue? No. They have a big group out oh, there. Oh, they do now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was aware of it. Sure. Uh, but I think it's grown over oh, time. Oh yeah, I'm from sure what I hear. Yeah. <laughs> People visit that out there. Well, congratulations! Now you're the dean, and let's talk a little bit about that. Some challenges and in your initiatives. Well, and I I was the dean for between four and five years. And uh, I liked the job, it was challenging, but it didn't work out very well. And I think the reason was I wasn't strong enough to be a dean in the, 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 those days. And also, some of my uh, faculty members were former faculty members of mine, and that just didn't quite rub right. They come from UCLA? No. Oh, from here. People from I had had, professors I'd had when I was in as the a PhD student. program were still there. And so after four or five years, I, it became clear they didn't want me to be the dean, and so I said, fine, I'll just stay here and be a professor. And so that's what I did the rest of my career, was just teach and do research and, okay. and finance. I want to talk a little bit about the deanship. But one, there, was, there was an article in the Journal Courier about a year after asking your highlights of the first year, and a couple of comments in that article said, getting to know the faculty better, realizing how talented, committed, and productive, how well-trained the graduates okay, who's, are. Who is saying Listen, this? Journal Courier interviewed you about a year after you were here. Oh, way back then. Okay. Yeah, right. Well, I guess. And, I, and how greatly they are they're valued are by the business firms that hire them as students. Yes. So it must have been a pretty busy first year. It was. It was. Very it, challenging. Getting acclimated, <laughs> right. Um, and the other thing is skills that future managers coming out of uh, Purdue, where those are some of the things that you... 
thought a little bit. Yeah, about. and I thought that the uh, I thought that the Craner was a, a very very useful combination of engineering and science skills on the other hand, and then the management stuff that we were trying to teach our students. Right. Did you have uh, an extensive faculty recruitment? Did you have to fill some of the faculty positions when you came? Well, the faculty uh, the faculty at Craner was at that time when I came back here in '79, probably. 65 faculty members. That's not a big school. And, in, and today it's probably maybe 80, so it's not grown that much. It's, sure. it's always been a relatively small management school. Sure, okay. Now it's combined with economics, so I'm not quite sure how that all counts out. Right. I always thought that the fact that the economics department was part of the Craner school. Didn't that st didn't that used to be something with humanities at one time or liberal arts or no, or uh, no. it was always no, a part was, okay. uh, there was there before I got here there was a uh, I guess you'd call it a school of industrial management and M Weiler was ran that and at some point he wanted to do something else and so he started the Craner school of management which made it more than just economics Sure. Now you were you were the third you were the third dean, so you yes. replaced John Day, who was had That's went correct. on to de development. Yes. Afterwards. Yes. Okay. All righty. I was the third dean and the first alumni right. of the school. How about that? To be a dean. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I came back. Right. right. Uh, <coughs> a couple of thing, uh, things. The student management investment fund. You s started. That, I started right? that. That came much later. That okay. came probably. Oh, I don't know. Maybe. Not while you were dean, was after when you oh, were teaching. Oh, much okay. after that, yeah. And I was teaching investments. Tell, tell uh, the researchers what that fund. Well, it was, uh, there, were, there, were other, there were other schools around the country that had these organizations or entities. Someone put some money out and says, let's let the students run it, invest it. And so a guy, I forget his name, gave the school $100,000, $200,000, we had a group of students who, many of them who I'd had in class, were interested in doing something for real, and so they managed that money. They did that for, oh, I don't know how many years. It may be still going now. I did it until I retired as the dean, and even even a little bit beyond that. And now, then someone else took it over. What do they do with the? I mean, what they invest and in then, securities? Then do they? If there's some profit or anything, who gets? No, the, so the profit, it, it stays with the school. Okay. It's, it's under the Purdue Research Foundation. Oh, okay. Okay. The money, the proceeds of the fund, at least then, could be used for uh, school, or, I'm sorry, student activities. Such as conferences, Oh, yeah, any, any, things, anything like that. Student or student I think it's a very useful oh, uh, yeah, thing. Right. In fact, uh, after I turned it over to, to another professor, Michael Cooper, they actually were, had the best one of these things in the country, as measured by how well the investments did. Stick with them, right? Oh, they yeah, stick with, stick with them, right? <laughs> they got a good deal. And the students that were in that, the, 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 these were MBA students, by the way. These MBA students that had this experience, they really were attractive in the marketplace because they had the, they'd had this hands-on sort of thing. Right, exactly. Um, another thing was that did, um, the Craner Executive Forum course, and I know that you, and that's one that was already going when you came. That here. was going here. A fellow by the name of Fred Macklemore was doing that. He was on the faculty, and he, uh, I was interested in it because it attracted a lot of uh, well, very successful and wealthy uh, people from the corporate world. And so that we had a dean's advisory council, and most of them were on that. And uh, so that was a very good way to, to do development. Right, and it still goes on today, I think, doesn't it? Oh, oh yes, right. very active. Okay. That's right. Very okay. Active. Um, then what about curriculum and, and diversity when you were the dean? What about the school? About I don't curriculum? think diversity was ever talked about. I don't recall that it was. I mean, okay. I'm, I'm sure we were aware of, it, of the, you know, it would be nice to have a more diverse right. faculty. Was um, Cordell Bell, was he here when you he Oh, was yes. Here? He was one of my favorite people, one of the first persons I met. He, uh, Cornell, He's a nice, wonderful yeah, person. Yeah, you must have talked to him. Yes, I did not interview him because yeah. uh, I tried to, but he wasn't very well, and I wasn't able to. Yeah. Do. Well, those have been the later years. That's right. After he yeah. after he left Purdue, he loved to go to California, and he always referred to me as his 
California dean. <laughs> he did a great job for the school. Yes, he did. Yes. And, and a great way, great uh, persona, and just a wonderful relationship with the yeah, students. I don't think other schools at Purdue, I don't think there were very many that had anything resembling that. But boy, he, he was tough on those kids that he, he recruited. Them. Right, and he, they made him toe the line. Refused them, tell them they could not join a fraternity or sorority the first year until they made their grade, got their grades established. And, uh, but he men mentored those students for their, their whole careers for the most part. Right, I know he's, he came to a couple of events when we had our 2000 mill and we had the reception over in the Cranor School and he came down and chatted with the people. And really, really, very yeah. nice. Um, the, uh, another item I want to ask you about is that uh, cr the um, Credit Research Center. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, well, that I don't think that exists anymore, though, does it? Uh, no, it does not. Okay. Robert, I met him well, a few times, Bob Johnson. Well, he was my major professor. That's the same Johnson? That's the same Johnson. Oh, okay. He started that, and a couple of uh, the other finance related uh, faculty were involved in that. Charlene Sullivan, the name you may have heard, sure. was part of that. And I don't know when that. Uh, s s it said I established about 1974. Yeah, and lasted probably 15 years or so. Right. I I interacted. I met him. I used to see him a few times at Sarjoke or something yeah. like that. And I know that he was interested in some databases, some of which we had. And so sometimes I yeah. would share some information with him. Well, the rest of the finance faculty respected Bob Johnson and what he was doing, but in a way they didn't care. It was sort of his thing. And he what did was it. the nature of it? I mean, did that was it sort of a resource if you had some? Cre well, they did. Re they had they had faculty doing research on various credit issues, credit market. And then they would issue reports or yeah, things right. like that. So, okay. And I was on there. I was on the. Uh, you were on the board or the. Chair? I was on the board of that while I was the dean, and they they had two meetings a year, and they went to wonderful locations. I mean, just. If you pick the place that was nice. You're not here on campus? Oh, no. They were in Miami and <laughs> Las Vegas and heaven knows where else. And that was The fun. thinking was better on campus. The thinking campus. was better, right. Get a fresh, <laughs> fresh look. Right. Oh, <laughs> uh, you, you, you taught, uh, have you taught some things at the, um, in the Cranor Center for Executive Education and Research? Oh, yes. What, now that, that I they came on board in 83. Yes. Uh, and the building was dedicated. 83. Right. You mean the new you mean the, the new building that's, that's yeah, there? Yeah, but I had taught in that. I had taught executive education kind of courses for a long time. Even before the building was. Yes. Were you involved in the planning for that center? Yes, it, I raised the, dean? the money for that. Yeah. Speaking of that, brings a point. You hired Carrie McClanahan yes. to help. Did they not have a development person before? When that? I came here, the Craner did not have a development person. The only development person that I am aware existed at that point was James, no, John Hancock, who was the engineering dean, dean, had an administrative assistant who sort of helped him keep track of their donors and what they were doing. So when I, and I just thought, we've got to have a development officer or a person doing this. And the faculty just, did, they said, why are you spending money on someone doing development? I mean, it's, it shows you how far narrow sighted they were because today everybody's got a whole staff of people. It's a big so a, Well John Day was had moved into development. That's right. But that was but for the university. That's right, at the okay. university. Okay. And that wasn't decentralized as now in all the schools everybody has some we do and everybody else everybody does. Everybody has their own people. Which right. I think is the way you gotta to compete with the other good universities. Right. You have to have people out doing it. Right, and it you need at the happen. local level uh, who yeah. are interacting with the alumni and whatever. Well, when I came here, I just did it myself and until I just decided we got to have someone, and so I started, did a search and ended up with Kerry McClanahan, and he did that for two or three years and then decided yeah. to go on. Did they did they bring in somebody else afterwards, probably? or? Oh, yeah, we've always had someone. Okay. But okay. he did not. Um, did he also, would he have also handled alumni relations? Or more primarily well, development, or do you handle the alumni? Well, I, whatever was done, I probably did, and it was we didn't have a formal uh, alumni program as we think we would have to, but the school was small, sure. and the alumni of the school weren't that old, 
So over time, though, as our alumni have matured and gone on and become more successful, and as the school has aged, then we've well. had to do that. Right. As a matter of fact, my, if I mean, I think I'm correct in this. The school never had printer, never had a person dedicated to alumni relations until they hired a fellow about a year ago, and he's my son. Small and, world. And he, he lives in Carmel with my daughter, and uh, he's always wanted to come back to do something at Purdue. Did he, did he, is he a grad of Purdue? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Okay. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know if he's credit or science, but he, I, I think he's more of a mathematician. Okay. He loves the job. He just lives and bleeds Purdue. That's what we need. Yes. <laughs> like right. Drew Brees. <laughs> right, exactly. Oh. <laughs> Oh, you mentioned earlier a few moments ago about the Dean's Advisory Council, yes. and I thought you'd make a couple of comments on that. Some of the things that I read, uh, they were key, and you would appoint people, and then they'd be a certain term of office, and as a sounding yeah. board, and, and gave, yeah. Oh, yeah. Had, had they had advisory councils before you, or the uh, John I, had I them? Think, I, think, John. I think John Day had, although it was essentially the people were all enlisted by this, this uh, gentleman I mentioned before. Uh, Kerry McClanahan? No, no. Oh, Fred McLemore? Fred McLemore. With that, uh, was with the, the one that, with that had all executive the forms. Yeah. I can tell you a caveat. I, I remember one of the first times I traveled with Fred McLemore, we went to visit, uh, who was it? Ingersoll Rand, I think, on the East Coast. And so I was just going with him and just to learn what he did. And he, we went in there and walked into the headquarters of Ingersoll Rand and he just walked right past the receptionist. He said, let's go on upstairs. So we went upstairs, and I was just following him. And he proceeded to walk down this long hallway, clear to the end where he had an appointment with somebody, very important. And we passed, we must have passed 10 offices. And in every office, he knew the secretary. That <laughs> was the way he did contacts. He knew, he knew the right hand. I, I Who was answering the phone? <laughs> Who was answering the phone, right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. But the advisory council, and then you'd have meetings, and then we meet what, typically what? twice a year okay. for a day. And sometimes they'd come in the night before, and we'd have a dinner or something like that. But then the real work started on the next day and lasted all day. It was a, it was a tough day because these guys are very smart. They didn't want to mess around. They didn't want to waste time. So they just grilled us in everything we were doing. And right. if they didn't like what we were doing, these guys tended to, in a nice way, tell you that. You know? Right. Did they help with curriculum and enrollment and uh, fun, fundraising? Would they help a little bit with well, they, they were all Well, they were all donors to the school. And they helped us do fundraising. In fact, some of those gentlemen were uh, uh, very key people when we raised the money to do the to build the Brainerd Center that right. opened in 83. Right. That's a, that, you're lucky to have that location. It's just oh, a yeah. Right. yeah. Well, that was uh, the Cranert Trust was where the money, the Cranert to money first school, came to start trust. the school. And that opened it in about 65. And then when I got here, they were had just about decided they were going to give away the rest of their money. And so John Day who was still around in development, helped me get in to see them again, and I had never lost touch with the Cranard people. And we got $3 million, which was really the last part of the Cranard money. And everybody was all excited about building this new building. Well, it turned out that $3 million just paid for the structure. It didn't pay for any of the, any of the accoutrements, the furnishings. And Fred Ford said, well, Keith, you've got contacts. Go out and raise it yourself. Well, that's what happened. I had to raise the, the other million dollars to... To get the furnishings. To, that's the right, right. The in, inside, the infrastructure. Yeah. I really enjoyed the external part of uh, being the dean. But that was development, alumni kind of relations. Uh, the harder part was working with the faculty to try to improve the curriculum. And that's because I think I just was... They didn't care for me. Or yeah, that or curriculum or change. Yeah, right. right. Uh, the MSI, you talked about the MSIA program, that doesn't exist. They don't, do they yes, have that? Yes, I think it Do still they still exists. have that? Yeah, okay, but that was one of the early ones. Because well, that was, yeah, that was the program where... And that was an 11 month and you could do... 11 whatever. months and it was mostly engineers who wanted to, to learn some management and they didn't want to 
stick around for two years like the MBAs tend to do. Sure. So they uh, started that program. I, it still exists. Yeah, it's a good program. Um, some, of the, in, some of the students were designated as Cranard Scholars that were graduates of that program. Uh, for researchers, what would be it? Was that just a special recognition? Yeah, uh -huh. okay. exactly. Okay. Uh, as a result of their commencement or graduate. But they used to have a separate program. They wouldn't necessarily uh, go into the commencement. Didn't they have a separate, separate graduation well, program? Well, I think because of the... Uh, and I think some of the articles yes. I read, you helped out, and sometimes uh, uh, Dr. Barron came, Strunther Arnott came one time when they had the ceremony. Right, right. I'd forgotten about that. Yeah, I think they had separate graduations just for those small... The ceremony itself. And, and there would only maybe be, you know, 70 or so. It wasn't a huge program. Right, okay. Yeah, I had forgotten that. Uh, now, we'll move on. You stepped down as dean in 1983 to go back to teaching and research. Talk a little about your teaching in securities and accounting and also the reporter time with the technical assistance program. Are you familiar with that program? Yes, I am. Yeah, that's, uh, I it's was grown a lot. I was involved in that in the following sense. One summer You were involved in I decided time. to uh, spend the summer with my youngest daughter, Julie, in Southern California. So we just went out there for a few weeks. And while I was out there, I got a, a call from the current, the existing dean, Ron Frank. And he says, Keith, uh, uh, we've got a new program here called... Uh, Technical Assistance. TAP. Oh, TAP. The TAP, okay. the acronym. He said, would you like to be involved? And I said, sure, but what is it? <laughs> I had no idea what it was. And when I got when I came back in the fall, they were just getting started. And they had a, a group of about oh, maybe eight or nine faculty members from various disciplines. I was the only one from management, but there was one from engineering and science and all that. And they were trying to uh, they were they needed to hire someone to run the uh, to run TAP. And they had about decided on an older almost retired engineering type guy to do it. And I thought, this is not right. So I made, I made a big fuss about that and said, look, we got to get someone with some administrative or management skills. So we did a, we started over on the search and we ended up with Dave McKinnis, who runs it to this day. Right. And I was the faculty member for, oh, many years, a dozen years. For, 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 you mean for Cranard, for the Cranard yes, School? Yes, okay. re representing the Cranard School. And that meant that I had two second year MBA students who were typically the best students in the class or in the, in the school. And they helped, the three of us went around and called on companies that had problems and we tried to help them solve those problems. But the students did most of the work. I just sort of well, led that them. was experience for them. It was oh, like an internship oh, yeah, or whatever. It was a wonderful. And you sort of advising the overseer exactly. or whatever. That has been a very, very successful program. Now yes. it's grown and it's way beyond. Uh, oh, they have a lot of different, they've gone into me, uh, to the uh, medical field and a lot of things too yeah. as well. So you know about that. I, I've heard, well I knew Dr. Dr. Limecourt one time was uh, Ferd, I know Ferd, it. yeah. Yes. Ferd was the guy, who, so Dave McKinnis came here and, and Dave had a degree from Cranard, a graduate degree but not a PhD, and Ferd said, Dave, if you're going to stay in this profession forever, you need to get a PhD. So Ferd Limekuller helped Dave McKinnis get his PhD in industrial engineering. Right. Oh, okay. I've met, I met Dave a few times. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Diana Wright. Really One nice. of my best friends. Yeah, really nice. Um, the uh, publications, one of the things that you did was that Asset Allocation Investment Horizon. You've done a number of publications. That kind of dovetails in many of your teaching yeah, well, asset allocation, in my opinion, is the single most important decision any of us have to make. Uh, you know, as, as an individual, as an investor, or even an institutional investor, you have right. to decide where you're going to put your money. Not so much individual investments, but what asset classes, stocks, right. bonds, real estate. So yeah, I did a lot on that. And I still think that's one of the most important decisions, and many people I've asked them, you know, what is your asset allocation? And they sort of know what the words mean, but they don't know what it numerically is. what theirs is. Right. And you have to know that, I think. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the association, but it, when you were still uh, with the school, you were the chair of the development committee for the Public Schools Foundation here in the community. That was what I've been very active in the community. There was a the picture community. in the paper. Right. Boy, you've gone way back. 
I do my research. You do. I need to. Yes. <laughs> well, just sharing of information. Yeah. Yeah. Then, but you're still involved with the public. No, I did that for. Uh, does that does that foundation still exist? Yes. Kind of, oh, it does. Okay, I yes. didn't ring a bell with me when I uh, uh, about I, her. Things. Martha Schrader. Oh, okay. You know her? Uh, I've heard the name right. She lives at Westminster, as a matter of fact, and I see her every now and then, and we reminisce about those days. But uh, yeah, I don't know who runs it now. I, they probably. What been was through. what was that involved with the chair of the development committee for the public schools? For, I'm thinking of the research. Was it for the Lafayette, West Lafayette, or what public schools were we talking about? Did the I mean, foundation we, support? Well, the local schools, the local high schools, schools both yeah. both cities, Lafayette West, right. and the county as right. well. Right, right, yes. Okay. Do you have Whatever. events and things of that sort to develop it? Just tried to, and they get grants. Students, or not students, the faculty at the high schools would, uh, you know, put in a proposal to if they had, if they had eight hundred dollars, they could buy some things that would help their students to do something that would help them. Oh, okay. So it was not huge bucks, but it was very important bucks for the faculty or for the for the teachers. Or the student for the schools yeah. too, and they yeah. even small amounts you can. Oh yeah, you can do a lot. Right. Yeah. In some in some cases, uh, the fact that the teachers were just didn't have the resource; they just used their own money for that. Well, this uh, this helped that. There's the community foundation, which is another one, and, and the one who used to be who just recently headed that head that used to be with Purdue, the community foundation. I think then their offices are on uh, somewhere in Lafayette. I, I it's that. actually uh, yeah, it's actually at State Street. It goes way across town. The, the fellow that ran it for many years was a, uh, um, like Jim Klusman, but he d he does not he left about three years ago, oh, okay. and now someone else is with him. Right. Okay. Okay. What about? Uh, but that's much more big bucks, and they are the repository for people who give money. People put their people individuals families put money into that foundation, and then they have some say as to where the proceeds will be spent. Okay. Uh, were we ever fact fellow at any of the residence halls? The what? Faculty fellow? No. Okay. I spoke at a lot of them, but I never was. <laughs> not, n never anything that quite ha like that. That has changed a lot. Has it? Well, I think one of the things is with the, with the dining now, not in the residence halls, oh, and they have those centralized things. And I was a fact fellow at, at uh, Tarkington for a long time. And it was nice because you could go over there and then they would come down. But uh, I'm no longer, I've mm. sort of given it up. I had done it for a long time. And they used to have a lot of social events yeah. and things, winter whispers and things of that sort. But I talked to a couple of others, and it's hard to get the people. Then you have to meet either in the Ford or to the new Wiley. And yeah. it just is difficult the dining to get really the, did change a lot, didn't it? It sure did. Uh, I mean, it has a good point, but it makes a difference when the eating and the residence is not in the same building. And you could sort of interact together, you know, rather than rounding them up. Um, fa family, do you have, you have children? Did your children go to Purdue? Uh, yes and no. Uh, okay. I have two daughters. They're one is forty and one is about forty-two, I think. And when we came back here, they were in the West Lafayette school system, okay. which is where else did you live when you first came here? I lived uh, on uh, Bexley Road, just a stone's throw from this, the high school. Okay. Lived there until. Uh, well, I lived there for till, uh, until about. They could walk to school. Eight. Oh yeah. Great. Good it was, location. It was a good location. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, my uh, one daughter, my uh, oldest daughter, started at Purdue and in Craner, but she was just messing around. She wasn't a serious student. And I don't know if she got, she, she may have gotten kicked out, but she finally came back and got a degree in uh, supervision. Worked for a couple of companies for a while, but just didn't care for it. And finally, one day, day announced that what she really wanted to be was a pharmacist. So then she came back to Purdue and went through five years or so of pharmacy and got her far she, doctor of pharmacy degree and so that's been her that's been her is she is she just lived does she live in Indiana no she well she or did she, but oh, then she uh, after she got her pharmacy she degree. spent she spent some time in Portland Oregon and then she met her future husband in my class of all places when I was teaching an undergraduate investment class they sat beside each other and I don't think they dated or anything like that, sure. but they knew each other. And then she came back many years later. When she was in the pharmacy school? Yeah, or okay. afterwards, and, and, uh, and went to a football game and ran into John, J-O-N. That's the guy she ended up marrying. And he, he was just 
shocked. He had no idea that she wasn't married yet. So, uh, was he married? No. Oh. So they got married, and they now have two sons. Good. My well, grandson. Where else are they living now? They live in Carmel. Oh, okay. So but John know. now is working. He's the one that's coming. He's the working in the alumni thing. The, I'm not sure how long he can do that. That's just tough to have to hard. drive that far and have two boys and all that. It, it is I hard. don't know. <laughs> yeah. My other daughter lives in. Uh, in, in a suburb of uh, Orlando. Her husband is a physical trainer, and they, they built a business, physical training business, for, for people, um, individuals, just, families. Uh, not, not necessarily with athletics, but say just people. No, just home. people in general, yeah. yeah. Are you familiar with this Miracle Fitness over here? I know the name, but I'm Well, it's kind of like that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, business is good? Well, it's been tough, and but they're getting there. <laughs> I think they're at least going to survive. I hope. That's okay. <laughs> they have no children. So. Oh, yeah. They have two big dogs, and that's it. <laughs> so I have two grandsons and two big dogs. You got a, mo a yeah. menagerie. That's thing. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Dad is here. Um, you got the distinguished alumnus. We're talking about awards and honors in the college from College of Engineering. Yeah, that's State. one of my proud things that I accomplished, and I had not done a lot of stuff for the university there except, I guess, be somewhat successful in my career. And sure. so I was called, I don't know what year it was, but... Since 2000. Yeah, so several years ago I got called. And, and I had, at that time, was my wife and I were going over to Ohio State football games. I'm a big Purdue basketball fan, but I'm a diehard Ohio State football fan. So we typically go over to one game, home game, in Columbus every year. And so I got to sort of know some of the people over there. And sure. Gave him some money, and then that led to one thing or another, and so I always get good football tickets there. <laughs> it helps out. And that was a nice award. I felt good about that. That's they they only give about, oh, I think every year they give maybe six or seven of those distinguished alumni. It's very nice. Yeah, it it's is. kind of special, right? It is. Along with along with being with the Buckeyes, right? Yes. <laughs> and then there was an article that came out in the Journal of Finance Literature in the winter of 2005. You were cited as six percent of the finance researchers. And they're number 233, the prolific authors in the finance literature, a half center of publications. Very good. Well, the, the two guys that were really, the, the, the two finance professors that have really put the school on the map were uh, Bill Llewellyn and uh, John McConnell. But I had done enough in my early career that I sort of got tacked onto that list, which made I was pleased to do that. Very nice. But my research really, after I was the dean, didn't go very far, very far. I mean, I kept doing it, but it wasn't the that's, way it was That's earlier. okay. That's very nice. Uh, professional associations, what, the Academy of Financial Services? Do you are you still involved in any professional association? No, anymore? most of them I, ha I do no longer belong to. I When I retired, I just quit getting the journals. And I right. used to go to professional meetings all the time oh, yeah. and get papers and all that. That was fun, but uh, at, at a point, I just had enough of that. What about consulting? You're, done, you're still doing some consulting? I still do consulting. Okay. Uh, my, my, my steady thing is there's a, a gentleman in uh, Southern California, Beverly Hills, who has an investment management firm. He manages uh, the wealth of individuals, big wealth people. Many of them, in, you'd know the name, many of them in the entertainment business. And I met him when I was at UCLA on the faculty. and. Just start talking to him, and we started playing racquetball. And one day he said, "Well, would you occasionally want to do a little consulting job for me? You know, a couple hundred bucks here and there?" And sure. So we talked, and one thing led to another. And um, about 1976, he said, "Well, let's just make this a more permanent, put you on retainer, pay you so much a month, and I'll call you when I need to talk to you." Well, I'm still doing that, and I've helped him when he hired some younger guys to try to mentor them as they began to get into the investment management profession. He's my age, 72, and I don't know how many more years he'll do this, but uh, and one of the interesting things that happened was uh, at some point he said, uh, how much do you charge? And uncharacteristic, you charge. how much would I charge to be a consultant to him? And my response to him was, I don't know, just pay me what you think it's worth. I've never said that to anybody else on any consulting assignment, and he's been paying me very nicely for 30 years. Now. That's great. Yeah. It was the right remark at the right time. I, the re <laughs> the lucky <laughs> remark at the right time. 
Oh, now retirement activities. One thing, of course, is the book that you and your wife published. How long did that to take you to get that? We started, You've we, done a lot of publications, but that's your newest one. That was the, the latest thing, the latest yeah. book, certainly. Uh, we were at Sanibel. We used to go to Sanibel. We were walking on the beach one time, and I was getting into retirement. And I said, well, Jane said, what are you, you going to do next? I said, let's write a book. And she had gone through the MBA program by, at Cranert by then, and so she knew a lot of the things I was talking about. Sure. You know. So we just wrote this book, Personal Financial Strategies, it's called. And we shopped around and couldn't find a publisher, so we ended up having the uh, the press did it. The press, right. and uh, they did a terrible job of promoting it. I complained bitterly to. Who was the the was that Tom was Tom Bacher the editor? Bacher was there. I liked he, him personally. Left. I know he's so left. Good. He I went told. To, I went to Akron. He's been he? gone for a couple of years. Yeah. I complained bitterly to Jim Mullins about that guy. It just seemed to me they they could do better. I mean, they could promote things. Did you, but how were the sales? Not so good. Not good. I mean, I've made in, ever since the book came out. I've been. I've probably my wife and I have split less than a thousand dollars in revenues that we just hadn't done. Very disappointing. Oh, that's too bad. Now it may be the book. I don't think so. The book was well done. It looked nice, but it just didn't. They didn't promote it. But you have to keep spreading the word about. I guess people yeah. can use it. Want to buy a book? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. Not right now. Um, a couple of things also you mentioned. On the, the, are you still with the West Lafayette Economic Development? What are some no. other activities you're doing in the community knowledge? Well, or? yeah, I've been I've done a lot of things in the in the Lafayette community since I've been here. I've done more more recently once I started getting away from the academic trials. Uh, the two thing, the three things I do right now. One, I'm involved at Westminster Village. Okay. Uh, a number of different ways, and then I'm on the. Uh, they have a development board or committee or something. Yeah, I was on the at Westminster. I at West, did I say Westminster? Yeah. Right. Right. There's a Westminster uh, Village board. I was on that for six years, but no longer. Now I'm on the Westminster Fo Village Foundation board, which is not as active as the the uh, Village board, but I'm doing that also in the. Lafayette Symphony Orchestra Foundation Board. And those meet three or four times a year, and I, I'm very interested in music. And uh, my wife was actually on that board, governing board, for a while, but she's no longer doing that. But okay. I'm on. So those two foundation boards, and being a, being a Rotarian, I'm active there for 20 years. That means years. every week, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Just, just came. I know. That's the only I, reason I, I'm dressed up. If you call this being dressed up. Is it today? It's Tuesday it's today? Tuesday. I should know because I've interviewed quite a few people and they say, well, I'll come after it or whatever. After Rotary. <laughs> but when you mentioned 2 o'clock, I said, well, that'll work just fine because I <laughs> usually get home about 1.15. My wife also belongs, by the way. Oh, okay. So that's kind of something we have in common. We go to those lunches. It sounds to me like you're keeping in the community and you were saying earlier, you really got California in your blood, so you, but you decided to keep your roots here? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, we like the community. I would, would not want to live in California again. I like to go out there yeah. <laughs> two or three times. And, and I, I get to go out there two or three times a year because, you have, a, uh, because uh, of this consulting thing. That's he right. flies me out, sees some of my old friends and all that. Right. Um, I'll leave it up to you. I was going to ask you a little bit about what management education and manager in the 20th century or some closer oh boy. remarks. What do you think? It's changed a lot. It has. Um, I'll let you make some comments or something I forgot to add. Well, I'm not sure what I... That's a tough one. You didn't have that on your list. I think the, uh, the tough thing about uh, management education is is trying to stay in the at the top. And Craner has given it size in its history. I think it's done a very good job of keeping high in the ratings. They've slipped recently, though, and we're not quite sure why. Uh, that's got to be remedied. And maybe the new dean, when he comes, will help get that back on track. But they've slipped some. I, was, I usually ask of people like that for the rankings, and that's been going for a number of years. Other people in other schools is what I'm saying. Yeah, the right. Rankings, and they were coming out when you were dean, too. Yeah. The thing I don't like about the rankings is that they can be managed by the school. The school can almost dictate what their ranking is going to look like. It's how they answer. How they questions. tell their students how to answer the questions. I mean, that just it's doesn't make much sense. A lot of controversy. Absolutely. And I'm sure it's no different in other schools. All right. Yeah. 
Any uh, closing comments? Or no, this has been fun. Did I, for, did I forget? Uh, you did a very good job. You, I, I thank you, you covered the waterfront. I thank you very much, Dr. Smith. Yeah.